Good morning. Hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas. And uh, this is the first Sunday after Christmas Day. And we read our scripture earlier from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of Sorry according to St. John. Today is the feast of St. John the Evangelist. Our Sunday school lesson was on St. John the Baptist. The two men are referred to respectively as the Holy Saints John of Jerusalem. The feast day of St. John the Baptist is on June the 24th, and that of St. John the Evangelist is on December 27th. Both of them are close to the uh, uh, time of the change in seasons, respectively the summer solstice and the winter solstice. But in John 20, verse, beginning with verse 3, Peter set out with the other disciple uh, to go to the tomb. And uh, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that was the uh, Apostle John. And they came with Mary Magdalene to, to behold our risen Lord. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for letting us live through this pandemic. We thank you so much for letting us live to coming close to the end of 2020. We know this has been a year of unprecedented challenges, but we know there's nothing too hard for you, absolutely nothing. And down through the years, you have r rose up. You've brought into being, you've empowered various individuals, exceptional individuals for exceptional times. And such a person was St. John the Evangelist. Help us today to follow his example, even as he followed Christ. For it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. December 27th marks the feast of St. John the Evangelist. John, whose name means the Lord is gracious, is often called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, he was the son of Zebedee and Salome, and the brother of James, another of the twelve apostles. Christian tradition identifies him as the author of the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation. Collectively, these works are known as the Johannine literature. James and John originally were fishermen, and fished with their father in the lake of Gennesaret. John was first a disciple of John the Baptist, and later one of the twelve apostles of Jesus. It is interesting to compare the two holy saints, John, and uh, in their birthdays, respectively, June 24th, or uh, rather, not birthdays, but feast days, June 24th and December 27th. St. John the Evangelist appears to have played a prominent role in the early church. Peter, James, and John were the only witnesses of the raising of Jairus' daughter in Matthew 5, 37, of the transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 1, and of the agony in Gethsemane in Matthew 26, verse 37. Only he and Peter were sent into the city to make preparation for the final Passover meal known as the Last Supper in Luke 22, verse 8. At the meal itself, his place was next to Jesus, on whose chest he leaned in John 13, 23 through 25. According to the general interpretation, John was also that other disciple who with Peter followed Jesus after the arrest into the palace of the high priest in John 18, verse 15. John alone remained near Jesus at the foot of the cross on Calvary with Jesus' mother Mary and the pious women, and took Mary into his care as the last legacy of Jesus in John 19, 25 through 27. And while we can't, you know, it's interesting to note that the last time Joseph is mentioned at all in the New Testament is at, in the incident in the temple when Jesus was 12 years old, uh, talking with the elders, and they're marveling at his wisdom. After that, Joseph disappears from the scene. And 
it's more than likely that Joseph had died at some time before Jesus began his ministry. And thus, Mary was a widow, and that would have that committing her to his beloved disciple would not have been necessary if she had had a husband. More than likely, Joseph was dead, and so Mary was a widow woman, and thus Jesus committed his blessed mother to the care of his beloved disciple, John the Evangelist. After Jesus' ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, John, together with Peter, took a prominent part in the founding and the guidance of the church. He was with Peter at the healing of the lame man in the temple in Acts 3. And with Peter, he was also known, uh, thrown into prison, Acts 4, verse 3. He was also with Peter, visiting the new converts in Samaria, in Acts 8, verse 14. There's no positive information concerning the duration of John's activity in Judea. He may have remained some 12 years to this first field of labor until the persecution of Herod Agrippa I led to the scattering of the apostles through the various provinces of the Roman Empire, according to Acts 12, 1 through 17. It does not appear improbable that John then went for the first time, into Asia Minor. In any case, a Christian community was already in existence at Ephesus before John's first labors there, as recorded in Acts 18 through 27. Uh, such a sojourn by John in Asia in this first period was neither long nor was it uninterrupted. He returned with the other disciples to Jerusalem for the Apostolic Council about A.D. 51. And Paul, in opposing his enemies in Galatia, recalls that John explicitly, along with Peter and James the just, were referred to as the pillars of the church. It refers to the recognition that his apostolic teaching uh, of a gospel free from Jewish law received from these three the most prominent men of the Christian community at Jerusalem in Galatians 2, verse 9. Revelation verse 1, chapter 1, verse 9 says that the book's author was on the island of Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus when he received the vision contained in the Apocalypse. Evidence indicates that John lived to be nearly a 100 years old outliving all the other apostles. It is quite possible that he was kept alive for the specific purpose of receiving this vision. He says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and that has been described as the agony of an undelivered sermon. He was a prisoner at Patmos. He was away from his congregation in Ephesus, and certainly that was uh, an agony experience, but God came in and filled the void with a vision of this apocalyptic revelation, these things that must soon come to pass. John is credited with establishing a number of churches in Asia Minor and baptizing converts in Samaria. He had a long pastor in Ephesus, which is now a part of Turkey. Eventually he was banished by Roman authorities to the island of Patmos, where he then wrote the book of Revelation. According to Tertullian, in prescription against heretics, John was banished after being plunged into boiling oil in Rome and remaining unharmed. After the death of Emperor Domitian in 96, he may have returned to Ephesus, where he completed his ministry, serving as a mentor to Polycarp, who later became the Bishop of Smyrna and the teacher of St. Irenaeus of Lyon. John's tomb is thought to be located at Selkut, a small town in the vicinity of Ephesus. In art, John is represented by a number of symbols, including an eagle, emblematic of the word of an evangelist, a kettle, emblematic of the tradition that he survived an attempted execution in boiling oil. In orthodox icons, he's often de depicted looking up into heaven and dictating the gospel or the book of Revelation to his disciples, traditionally by the name of Prochorus. The Gospel of John begins, 
In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was anything, not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and this life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehendeth it not. Nowhere else in the Bible, since the beginning of Genesis, is the concept of light so inextricably entwined with the idea of the divine spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is inseparably linked within the beginning was the word. And as the concept of the word, the light and the divine are inseparable parts of the whole creation. And it becomes of primary importance to us John the Evangelist can lead us forward in that direction. It is only proper then that on December 7th, the feast day of St. John the Evangelist, a great man of God, that we should celebrate this important event so close to the winter solstice that we observed on December 21st. Yes, winter is here. Yes, these seasons, which are part of the divine plan, uh, all play out and all have their role to to, to uh, play. And uh, we're in the Christmas season. Actually, technically speaking, it goes to January 6th when the Feast of the Epiphany begins. But uh, we, rec we say that Jesus is the reason for the season, but, re but Jesus is the reason for every season. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Logos in Greek, the Divine Spirit, reason, insight that was possessed by so many. You know, the Jewish philosopher uh, Philo of Alexandria had a lot to say about the Word and about the Logos and it's the power behind the universe. And John the Apostle picked up on this. And later, my favorite of the church fathers, Justin Martyr, spoke about the Logos having possessed the... Uh, the Greek philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and all these that had lived before the time of Christ. So God had been a witness in ancient Greece. He, the Logos had possessed Moses and the Hebrew prophets. And in the Kairos, in the fullness of time, the Logos, the Word, became flesh in our per our Lord and Savior in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. That is the doctrine of the incarnation. Incarnus, in flesh, God becomes man. God takes on human form. God becomes man in Jesus Christ. And he points this way. He went to St. John the Baptist and he asked to be baptized. Not that he had any sin to wash away. He had no sin. But he said, this is done to fulfill all righteousness. Both the Holy Saints John had their roles to play. And both of them played their roles very well. We have our roles to play today. Nobody, no two people have the exact roles, to play, same roles to play. And often we uh, get messed up when we, we try to play somebody else's role instead of our own. But through prayer and through study and through gaining understanding, we can understand what our role is. As we turn to Christ, as John the Evangelist did, he stood with our Lord to the very end. And when our Lord was dying on the cross, he gave care of his blessed mother Mary to John the beloved disciple. John the Evangelist. He took in, her in her home and cared for her. We don't know how long she was here after that. He did that job, but he still played a great role as pastor at Ephesus and went through persecution, spent time in the salt mines there on the Isle of Patmos. But even a place like that where he seemed so deserted, life had, had turned on him. God appeared to him. And that's where that marvelous book of Revelation came from. The Spirit of God 
revealed itself to John the Evangelist. He gave us the Gospel of John. He gave us the Epistles of John. He gave us the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. All such wonderful gifts. Oh, and it's, isn't it wonderful when a man or woman opens their lives up to the Holy Spirit and let God use them in such a great and mighty way? That's what John the Evangelist did. And I challenge you to do the same thing today. It begins by repenting of your sin, putting your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and then allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you to make your life something beautiful for God, even as was the case with St. John the Evangelist. And so I greet you on this day, the Feast of St. John the Evangelist. God bless.